our talk about the new dynamic mixing system of PIX4. My name is Silvan, and I will do this talk together with my colleague Beat. We are both part of the flight control team at Otterion. So, ooh. <laughs> together with many others, we have been in the last couple of years been working on improving the current mixing system of PX4. And we have recently reached a state where we can use it on all existing uh, PX4 vehicles. Um, some of you may still remember that on the DAF Summit years ago, I made a similarly named talk together with uh, Julien Lecourt, where we focused on the algorithm that he um, contributed and also showed some first results. Um, it then was though still a very long, long way from this date to the current implementation where um, it's easy to configure and it's usable with the existing control pipeline. Mainly thanks to the big push of Beat recently, this is now there. So in this talk, we really want to focus on how the new system improves, improves the ease of, uh, makes it much easier to configure the system. And secondly, how we now can support fancy new uh, vehicles and also new um, controls. So let's get started. Um, I will cover the first half of this presentation where I will um, give you introduction to mixing and then um, we'll do a very much user focused um, introduction into the config configuration process. Then Beat will take over and talk about some implementation details and then give you an example of how um, the new system can be used to um, fly a fancy new drone. And in the end, we will close up with an outlook. So the PX4 control and driver pipeline basically lives beside, inside these two things. So you have the position set points through a um, ground station or an RC from the user. And on the right hand side, we have the actual actuators um, on the drone that then um, are used to execute these set points. The first part of the controller is a very much generic one that um, consists of diverse cascaded control loops of position, velocity, attitude, rate controllers and gives out um, torque and thrust set points. This part is the same or almost the same for a three copter as for octocopter. On the so on the to make them this specified to a vehicle, we need the second part here, which is much more vehicle specific, which then um, allocates the um, thrust and torque to actual commands. So from now on, we will use mostly the term allocation for what we before called mixing. This step also um, takes into account the actual protocol that the actuators need to um, be able to talk to them. Um, right, so to make allocation a bit less abstract, I will first do a quick detour into the real world, where actually the flow is inverted. So we have um, actuator commands that result in some torque and thrusts um, that the actuator has produced then. So the first step to get from that one to the allocation is to model your, alloc uh, your actuators. Um, depending on the type of actuators and your use case, this model can be more or less sophisticated. Note though that now we still have like the inverted flow. So we have commands resulting in some torque and thrusts. But so, and to get from that on to the allocation, we need to have some kind of inversion, um, which takes place in the algorithm that does that. Um, in this talk, we will not so much um, focus into, onto that part of the control pipeline, but rather on the modeling or the configuration of your system to um, model the, the physical properties of the actuator. So let's get started with the configuration. Um, for that, I want to do it on the example of this quite complex system of a tilt rotor VTOL. So it's a system with four, multi four, four motors that are tilted upwards for hover flight. Um, the front two are actually tiltable, so they can be used to control the heading or the yaw of the vehicle, and then can be fully tilted forward to produce forward thrust for uh, the fixed wing flight part. 
It also has four control surfaces to then control it during the fixed wing flight. The configuration for the legacy workflow, so how it was till now, lives in several scripts that were loaded into the um, PX4 controller and in some case even required uh, rebuilding of the firmware in case you change something, for example, the geometry of your frame. For many of you, I guess, this look, these files look familiar and for those of you who have never seen it, I guess now it's too late to get started there and don't even try to understand them. They're quite complicated to understand. So for now, when I will talk about the new workflow, um, first of all, some facts about it. It's supported now in the latest release, so 113, though not yet made default, so we still have the legacy mixing as default. With 114, we plan to fully replace the legacy workflow with the new one, and also, I guess, fix some minor bugs till then. Um, it's fully configurable in QGC, so no longer any scripts are required to adapt the system to your um, custom vehicle. Um, the transition from the legacy to the new mixing system should be able to be, do, be done without any retuning, um, as the controller is the same and the mixing is also working on normalized values. For, to make it work on the current PX4, you need to set the system variable syscontrolalloc to 1, and as well as select your current airframe type. You see the, all the, the list of um, the supported airframe types, airframe plus rover plus, yeah, it's not just airframes, but vehicle types. All right, so now, quickly how or what we actually need to model or configure on our actuators. Starting with multi-copters, so what we want to end up with is a root model of, crude model of your, of the thrusts and torques produced by them. Um, in the most basic setting, all we need to have here is the position of the actuator, um, the spinning direction to model like, the torque of it correspondingly. And of course, we need to know the numbers of actuators that are in place on the drone. These can now be set, or these values can now be set very easily through a UI in QGC. So we define, or we set numbers of, of um, multi-copter actuators and then define the position of them in X and Y, as well as set the spinning direction. Um, for more advanced setups, there's also the ability to configure additional um, things like the motor axis, propeller coefficients in case you have differently sized propellers. Um, you can add a motor slew rate and um, you can define if the motor is actually reversible. For fixed wing or control surfaces in general, it's much more difficult to model them in the same way with these uh, measurable values as for multi-copters. Um, to have there a model, you would need to do some kind of system idea as many, many um, factors come into play. For example, the orientation, the deflection angle, the size um, and the position of them, but also less easy to measure um, values like the turbulence efficiency factor or um, effect from prop wash over them and so forth. Um, Though it's actually the case that usually you have dedicated actuators per axis and not like in the multicolor case where one actuator is acting on all the axes at the same time. So what we did here to make the configuration easy is to directly interface with the with normalized um, technical scale values. What that means is that a value of one would indicate that if this actuator was fully deflected it would result in a maximum torque around the corresponding axis. Um, to make the process even easier to set up, um, we introduced uh, a type for the actuators. So if you then set the type to, for example, the L1, you automatically have the um, effectiveness on the roll and pitch filled out to the correct value and don't need to change anything manually unless you have a custom or special setup. All right, I will now very briefly walk you through the whole process of setting up a new custom vehicle 
Um, it's going to be very fast, so don't expect to follow everything. It's just meant to be a quick overview of what steps are required now. Again, on the example of the tilt rotor retool I showed before, so first I select the airframe type in QGC and then reboot vehicle and QGC. Then in the actuator tab, there is dynamically the UI adapted to the vehicle type. So we now have a section for the multi-copters, multi-copter motors, um, the one you saw before. For retail just we have no visual feedback on the geometry, but otherwise it's the same. So we set here geometry, define the spin direction, go on to the control surfaces. Here it just go through and set types for, for them. So ailerons and retail servos. And then on the bottom set the tilt servos. We have two of them and we need to define which motors to actually tilt. And that's all that's required for that part. On the right side now you have the actuator output uh, mapping. So this is actually mapping the actual hardware pins to our, our um, configured actuators. Um, on the AUX outputs, we map now the motors. On the main pins, we want to map the, the servos. So first, we change the output type to uh, PWM with an uh, update rate of 50 hertz. And then we go through and um, select all the ARM control surfaces we defined before. And now can also um, directly change here some of the most important parameters, for example, the disarm value to have them um, level in disarm state, the control surfaces and not deflected. Now on the bottom, there's an actuator testing tab, which is very cool to quickly check if the wiring is correct and the direction of the motors and surfaces is correct. And you can also then change the direction here in the UI and also set the mean and maximum um, deflection parameters. Again, this was very fast. There's documentation to be found on the user guide. Um, I want to wrap up my part of the talk with um, going over some key new features that we have with the new mixing system. First of all, the thing I talked before with reversible motors. So we can now um, fly. That, that means we can now fly with a quad that's able to um, produce thrust in both directions, and thus we can flip it and fly upside down. Of course, we need um, special motors and ESC and motors to or ESC to support this feature. Then we now have the ability to select or enable the UAV CAN servos in the UI as well, beside PWM and DSHOT. Um, then we have flexible um, PWM and T-shot rates, as you saw before. We make use of capture pins on, newest, on newer PIXOCs. Um, there is flexible camera trigger and capture configuration possible on any of the pins. And last but not least, with the new allocation, um, it's actually a dynamic allocation, meaning that it's no longer static as before, but actually we, we can change it in air while already flying. And that al allows us to support uh, motor failures um, to be handled gracefully. So we can adaptively or actively change the allocation in case the motor failure was detected and remove this motor from the allocation and thus um, proceed flying and land safely. All right. That was my part of the talk. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, um, I will now present an overview of the implementation. So this shows the updated pipeline in terms of uh, UR modules and well, modules and uh, UR topics. But don't worry, you don't have to read all of this now. I will um, talk about the individual parts in detail. So essentially what changes is the output of the, from the rate controllers uh, to a new module that does the mixing. So the control allocator module there, and then the output drivers on the right side, or rather um, the library that used to do the mixing before. I will now dive into the left part of the pipeline. The previous implementation used the actuator controls topics from the rate controller as an input to the mixing 
Um, these are still used for some, some cases. You can see here for the flaps or air brakes, but are generally being deprecated and replaced with the normalized thrust and the torque set point topics that you see here on top. Um, these are then subscribed by the control allocator module. And this module takes care of the mixing and handles different uh, geometries. On the published topic side, there's a status that contains the saturation status, and then the two most important topics, the motor and uh, servo um, control signals. Um, these can be used for log analysis and in place of the currently used actuator outputs, although uh, these topics are published still as well. Yeah, going a bit into the control allocator module, um, you might remember this diagram from the introduction. Um, in terms of control, um, you can see on the left side, it builds up an actuator effectiveness matrix from the configuration, and then it inverts uh, this matrix using Moore-Penrose pseudo-inverse um, algorithm to get the actual allocation matrix um, here on the right side. Um, this is then used to map the control inputs, so roll pitch, EO, and thrust, um, to the actuator control uh, uh, signals. Yeah, moving on to the right side of the pipeline. Um, this includes the output drivers. Uh, so output drivers use a shared library, so the driver actually only has to implement the hardware initialization and, and update. Um, the driver specifies the number of channels, uh, minimum and maximum, if there are any, and configuration parameter prefix to use. Um, the rest is taken care of by the uh, shared library then. Um, its main task is to select from the input topics here on the left side, um, based on function configuration parameters that you can see on the right side. Yeah, so let me make an example here. Um, if you were to select um, motor 2 in the UI uh, in QGC uh, to assign that on channel 2, um, this would change the parameter here in the, in the middle. And then the library in turn in, uh, would then select uh, the second motor from the actuator motors topics and assign that to the second output. Yeah, the structure is generally um, generic and makes it very easy to add and define new output functions. Um, these are defined in this YAML configuration file. Now I will talk about how the UI is implemented. So traditionally a UI in QGC was implemented by hard coding all the parameters, descriptions and options um, in QGC directly. Um, this has the drawback of tightly coupling uh, PX4 with QGC. So for example, when adding something to PX4, we also need to extend QGC and even worse, if we were to change a parameter or remove it, uh, it can easily break uh, compatibility with QGC. Um, therefore, I selected a different approach here. Uh, when QGC first connects to PX4, QG, uh, PX4 um, sends information about all the supported geometries, um, actuators, and uh, configuration parameters. And QGC then dynamically builds the UI from that. Um, this has a number of benefits. So first, uh, the UI shows what the hardware actually supports. So for instance, uh, num the right number of uh, PWM channels. Then we only need to change PX4 when we add a new geometry or an output driver or a board configuration. And similar, we can easily change parameters. And then this mechanism is, is generic and can be used for other cases as well, 
for instance, um, serial or sensor configurations or um, the airframe selections. Yeah, if anyone's interested to work on that, let me know. There's also some drawbacks. One in particular is that it is harder to extend, so in terms of more effort, um, if, if the structure changes. So for example, if the UI expects uh, a list of parameters and you want to show a table of, of parameters, then you would need to change the uh, metadata definition as well. I will now explain how all of it works in detail. As mentioned before, uh, the UI is dynamically generated from uh, information from the vehicle. And here, as you can see, is an example for the motors and simulation outputs. So first, when a vehicle connects, um, QGC queries a JSON file, namely the actuator's JSON through the component metadata MathLink API. Um, this, in terms, uses MathFTP to download the file. The same protocol is also used for parameter metadata synchronization, for example. And yeah, this actuator JSON file contains all the information to build the UI, including the output drivers, so PWM and UAV CAN, etc., and including their channels, the geometry types, and how to configure them. So if we take another step, Step back, going into the PX4 source tree, uh, we see that the actuator JSON file is uh, generated when we build PX4 from multiple YAML configuration files. Um, this includes the geometries in the control allocation module and all enabled output drivers. So the example on top here shows the geometry definition and first we define the selection parameter, the CA airframe, and then we define the list of geometries. So here the multirotor, and then the multirotor defines its uh, actuators. Uh, here uh, the configurable amount of motors and position for each uh, motor. And if you go back and look on the right side, then you could see how this example looks like, looks like in the UI. And similar for the output drivers, they first define um, the name, the number of channels, and the parameter prefix to be used. All the other parameters are then automatically generated from that. So we're now coming to the example application. We wanted to test our implementation on an interesting platform that was not possible with plain PX4 before. Um, maybe you guessed it already from the title page, we selected an Omnicopter. As you know from, uh, as you know, typical multi-rotors can only provide thrust in upwards direction. However, an Omnicopter on the other hand can provide thrust in all three directions, um, so it does not have to tilt to move to a certain direction, and it can also hover at an arbitrary uh, tilt angle. This is achieved by arranging the motor positions and axes in specific ways, as you can see in this uh, image here. Yeah, this image is actually taken from the original research project that was conducted at ETH Zurich. And we took that design as our reference and started to create our own. Um, we started off with a model in simulation and verified that it flies as expected. Then we continued to design the 3D parts and printed those. Um, as you can see on the right, lower right picture, we use carbon fiber rods for the frame. And as the flight controller, we selected uh, Kakut H7 from Holybro, uh, which has a small form factor and can run easily or can be easily attached to the matching 4-in-1 ESCs. <coughs> 
It also comes with eight uh, D-shot outputs, which we need for bidirectional thrust. Um, for the GPS, we selected a helix antenna to get better reception at arbitrary tilt angles. However, we did not compare the performance uh, to a norm normal patch antenna. Then we use symmetrical bidirectional props, and we intend to publish um, this guide on the PX4 user guide, so anyone who's interested can replicate the setup. Yeah, Hamish already looks forward to that. <laughs> so this uh, shows the configuration uh, UI for the Omnicopter motors. Um, it is the advanced view. As you can see here, the motor axes are shown as well, because for a typical multi-rotors, you don't have to configure those. Uh, so as you can see, first we set the motors to be directional, then we set all the positions, uh, the direction, and finally the custom motor or uh, thrust axis. And this is really all that needs to be configured. Then we, yeah, let's see a short video, um, yeah, showing the Omnicopter in action. Yeah, first it's rotating around the roll axis. And if you look closely, you might be able to see some motors changing direction. And this is a flight with arbitrary attitude. And this is flying like a normal multi-rotor with tilt. And now the same command, but using 3D thrust, so it doesn't have to tilt. And here it's flying autonomously in an orbit mode while changing the, the attitude um, independently um, starting now. You can see on the left side. Uh, so for that, we did some minimal code changes uh, in PX4 to map the attitude to uh, an RC stick input. It's possible to fly in all high-level modes, including mission, for example, and control the attitude independently. Yeah, it can also change um, directions very quickly. And finally, I want to give a big thanks to a few people who helped with the project, uh, namely Jay, Matthias, uh, Simon, and Jonas. All right, um, we're coming to the outlook. So some ideas on what we can do next. Uh, first, when we change the default, we can remove the existing mixer implementation, uh, which frees up uh, quite a lot of flash space. Then it enables us to unify the VTOL control pipeline, uh, for instance, by using a unified array controller. It allows us to do flight performance improvements for vehicles with tilting rotors by using the dynamic uh, mixing. Then we can further improve on the fault tolerance, for instance, by including servos and servo feedback as well. And we can decouple the 3D thrust from tilt uh, for vehicles that support it. Yeah, and this concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them now.
Yes. Uh, I don't have a question. I just think this is why we all suffer. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. The Omnicopter or the whole <laughs> no, you set up? Cool. Thanks. Yeah, it was one of the changes I was long overdue in PX4 and yeah, finally had to push it through. What kind yeah. of for this? For the Omnicopter. Yeah, I'm going to repeat that question for the virtual audience. What type of applications do you see for this? So, I mean, in, uh, as a first thing, that was kind of our research project, like kind of testing out the implementation on what it can do. Um, but I think there is actually valid use cases. One that we thought is an interesting one is actually you don't need a gimbal anymore with this kind of control because it actually the vehicle becomes a gimbal in itself. It can actually hover upside down and actually change, look into the direction that you want. Um, but obviously there's some drawbacks to this. It's very inefficient. Uh, the flight time of this was actually uh, only about three minutes due to the bidirectional motors and uh, yeah, uh, eight motors that you have and the uh, different thrust directions. Yeah. yeah. Well, the first thing I also think everything is awesome. And uh, I think, so like the Omnicopter is really cool. Uh, I'm trying to push for this at, at Kihawk 2 kind of like, and you know, I mean, I think quadcopters should not die and everything should become canted hexcopters because like you can do so much with, with lateral force. And I was talking to someone doing like bridge inspection when you, I mean, if you want to clo go close to a bridge, you want to have like this, you know, fast sideways actuation to go back and forth and see how your camera is stable. So yeah, uh, so, and then the follow-up is of course like, uh, the controller, is it going to be part of, of stock PX4? And you know, how can we make it something that's very useful for, for everyone to have the sixth uh, degree of actuation. And like, if you have, again, if you have a hexcopter and you tilt your propellers like five degrees, you get five degrees, five, uh, you get like 10% of your, of your thrust that you can use as side force. And you only lose half a percent in, uh, in total thrust because it's a sine and cosine rule. So I think there's a lot of gains, like practical gains to just getting rid of quadcopters and moving to hexcopters. All right, thanks. Please. If you had to, let's say you had somebody come to me and want to create their new airframe using this new form of mix, to sell it to them, how would you estimate the time saving doing it the new way compared to the old way? Is it like 10 times, two times, like you're talking about? Days. Well, it depends. Uh, the question was how much time you can save with the new, like, new mixing compared to the old one. I mean, it so much depends on the experience of the developers, of course. Um, if you've been around for a couple of years, then probably you can do it in half a day with the old setup. With the new one you saw, it takes half an hour. Yeah. If you're new to PX4, then it takes you weeks at least. Yeah. And now, uh, hopefully, half a day, maybe yeah. even less. I have a question from the virtual audience, and the question is, if I have a drone with tilting propellers, can I control it without changing the flight controller algorithm? A drone with four propellers? Can you repeat? With, with tilting propellers. Propellers. I think he's just asking if, uh, do you need a change of firmware for this, so this is a configuration change. So the question was if... Uh, if I have a drone with tilting propellers, yep. can I control it without changing the flight control algorithm? Yes, basically we haven't tested it yet with tilting motors. Actually, yeah, we did. I, I tested it on, on a big copter and that works as well. But it really depends on the specific geometry. Um, yeah, you have to try it and see how it goes. I mean, some will need some customizations in code as well. Thank you. Can you elaborate on what you mean by a unified bridge controller? Yeah, I'll leave that. <laughs> <laughs> so the current beta architecture is um, set up in a way that you have two separate control pipelines, one for the fixed actuators and one for the multi-cup actuators. And in the end, they're mixed together. And 
with the old mixing system, we had no, no chance to mix them together. Uh, whereas now with new allocation, we can actually uh, move on to like single, uh, having just a single controller and to um, a more sophisticated mixing or allocation in the end to um, account for which flight mode you're in. Um, this is still a bit out. Maybe we require to move on from the normalized setup we have now to a really unit-based setup where we actually um, like work with actual newton meters for torque set points and newtons for thrusts, and then also do um, the system uh, or the allocation um, with um, system ID that gives out um, a unit-based allocation. Then we can move on to this much more uh, simplified in a architectural way controller that should then also be um, superior. I got another question. Are singularities during control allocation inversion handled gracefully? Well, it depends. I mean, yes, in the sense of it, it's defined, but um, it, it's if you have an overactuated system, then the optimization can sometimes output a bit strange um, configurations that you might not expect. It's it's mathematically correct, but you might it might look weird on on desired on the vehicle. So what you need to do is you add, add additional constraints in software and to actually um, yeah make the outputs in the way that you want to. Do. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, have you ever tried on a dual tail seater with vector trust? It's it's a vital what the tail seater can take off and landing on his belly, you know, like wind but with vector trust. Have you ever tried this? Uh, not yet. We flew on a normal tail seater without vector trust. Oh, uh, I have one with vector trust, so we can test it. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this one. Yeah. You're welcome to provide feedback actually on testing. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So he's volunteering for testing. Anyone else? Yes. Here you go. Uh, this is super cool. Thanks for working on it. Um, we have a, I guess, a motor controller that can, if you're sending serial commands, it can, you know, decide what you can tell it whether to work in position mode or velocity mode. Um, but if you're sending PWMs, it can only do one of the two. I saw something on your benefits slide about like this maybe allows us to send serial commands and not just PWM, or am I misinterpreting that? Yeah, so basically the architecture allows you to add your custom output driver now into your build. Um, that could be a serial, that could be a CAN output, um, whatever you want. And by adding this metadata that I showed you um, in the YAML configuration, it automatically shows you the UI for that driver. And so you can configure it in the UI. Super cool, thank you. You got, we got more questions? No? Yes, last one. Uh, so for the Omnicopter um, demonstration, how does it actually work for the controls? How do you actually map the RC controls and how does it actually get translated into torque and thrust uh, for that demonstration video? Yeah, you, you might know that if you have, if you look at the position and velocity controller, then it um, it generates a, a body thrust um, set point, which then is translated into an attitude set point for normal multi rotors. And it, essentially, with this part, we just replace that, and we output, we take the thrust um, set point and directly. Um, forward this uh, into the control allocator. And at the same time, we now have the attitude that we can change independently and set however we want. And uh, yeah, what I did is just um, take the manual control input, uh, actually the uh, an aux channel, and map that to, to a roll rate for that, yeah. Thank you. But this is essentially the part that we can make more generic and actually, yes, supply with, uh, with an 
support the in, independent interface to do that. That's, that's the plan there, yeah. All right, uh, thank you everyone. Any one more questions? We're good? Okay, well, thank you, Matthias. Oh, sorry, Beth and Silva. Uh, <laughs>